In today's video, we're going to be reacting to some creepy TikTok conspiracies. Let's get into it. They actually yep. did a study on a child's brain, an adolescent's brain, after they got done playing two hours of a video game. Mm. And they compared their brain to an alcoholic's brain. Yeah. And it was the same. What? Yes, it was the same. Really? From video games? Yes. Our brains have not adapted for the amount of stimulus that these pads and these screens and these games are throwing at us. I could see that because I, I took a five year break from video games. Yeah. And the day I came back, I felt like I was so high because all that adrenaline or whatever, just yeah. like shooting dopamine. in my head. I literally felt like I was high. Like, yeah, coffee. yeah. I mean, our dopamine receptors these days are getting literally, they're getting overrun and just worn down. Yeah. So it takes more and more and more stimulus for, for people to become happy. I wouldn't say that video games are as dangerous as alcohol. I, I really don't think that they are. I myself am a bit of a gamer. I've been gaming for as long as I can remember. My father's a gamer and I used to game with him. Let me know in the comments your thoughts about this. Do you think that video games are just as dangerous as alcohol? This new photo from the surface of Mars was an accident. The Mars Curiosity rover drove over this rock and crushed it, and inside were these yellow crystals. So obviously the rover did a 180 and then used an instrument on its arm to figure out what this is. Turns out this is elemental sulfur, which is just pure sulfur, which has never been found on Mars before. And elemental sulfur only forms in very specific regions on Earth, like volcanic regions or in sour gas reservoirs, which is obviously not where this rover found this rock. This area is not volcanic, but there is evidence that it had floods and avalanches in the past. But it gets weirder because the rover looked around and it saw other rocks that looked just like the one it crushed. In fact, a field of them. It is probably surrounded by elemental sulfur. And scientists don't know why it's there, how it got there, or what it means. This is where that field is on a map of Mars. And some good news, even though sulfur is known for smelling like rotten eggs, this shouldn't because it's pure sulfur and pure sulfur doesn't have a smell. One day we're going to harvest those crystals and bring them to Earth and they're going to be extremely valuable. You're going to see a lot of people that collect crystals probably want to collect Mars sulfur rocks. Look, I'm not trying to scare you in any shape, form, or fashion as always, but if there was an earthquake in the New Madrid seismic zone, it would be worse than if the San Andreas fault line had the big one that they've been talking about for years. St. Louis has the right idea preparing for a major earthquake in this area because this is the New Madrid seismic zone. It is quite literally bigger than the San Andreas Fault and if there was an earthquake in this area, millions of people would be affected. It would be catastrophic for the areas in red, severe damage for the areas in orange, moderate for yellow and then slight damage. That's half of our country if there's an earthquake in this area. And hear me out, the last earthquakes that occurred in this area happened over 200 years ago in 1811 and 1812, and they were a 7.7 .7 on the Richter scale. The United States Geological Survey estimates that there is a 25 to 40% chance that there will be an earthquake that is a six point or bigger in this area in the next 50 years. That's why St. Louis did what they did with preparing with the National Guard. It wouldn't just be St. Louis that is affected. Like I said, this would affect millions of people. Everyone needs to be prepared for earthquakes, especially if you live in this area. And yes, this area is active for earthquakes. There are about 200 per year. Most of them we don't feel, but so far this year, there have been 63 felt earthquakes in the New Madrid seismic zone. Let's just hope for the best on that one because 200 years is 200 too soon. What happens when you sit in front of a candle and meditate. Well, what happens is all fires burn at 10 hertz frequency. So when you're looking at that, you're actually sinking your brain to alpha. Do you ever wonder why the gurus go into the Himalayas? The Himalayas actually vibrate at 7.8 hertz frequency. You're actually triggering theta. What that does is it instructs your nervous system to produce GABA. And GABA is a precursor to DMT. So if you want to have your own DMT experience, that's one of the ways you activate it. And that's why people that meditate, if they get into the deeper states, they can have these spiritual experiences because we're chemically coded for that you just need to trigger it i am a big believer while meditating that's what helps unlock dmt to give you certain spiritual trips like astral projecting or feeling as if you're in a different planes of existence i truly think that if you can tap the right frequencies while meditating that it helps drip feed dmt throughout your body and it gives you those experiences that's what helps you move beyond that veil i just came across one of the most eerie listings by far. Welcome to 23224 Flint Ridge Drive in Kansas, Oklahoma. From the outside, the property itself doesn't look bad. It's actually fairly large. I mean, this is an aerial view. Like, this is a huge property. So now let's take a look inside. 
Well, hopefully the main entrance doesn't start right here because the property is just completely unfinished. I mean, look at the inside. And what is this in the corner? It's in the middle of nowhere. It's a like a large estate, zero bedrooms, zero bathrooms, no guardrails on one side of the house. Like the vision is unclear. Is it just me? Like the whole property is just like this wrap around and it's just empty. I mean, it looks like there was somebody living here. I mean, I think that the caution tape is a kind gesture, but I've never seen anything like this before. I mean, look at the scale of this thing. This is in the middle of nowhere. And that's actually a pretty cool looking house. And it was really interesting that they just left a knight statue like the one that I have. It's a pretty unique looking house, kind of ugly, but I kind of like it. It kind of reminds me of a circus tent though. From what ancient powers is the Simpsons drawing from? And why does Marge look like a high priest's daughter from over 3,000 years ago? Archaeologists found a 3,500 year old sarcophagus near the Egyptian city of Minya in October of 2023. The Egyptian coffin had the mummified remains of Tadi Ist, the daughter of the high priest of El Ashmunain. Where it gets weird is with the drawing on the inside of the lid. It looks like Marge from The Simpsons. The woman has yellow-hued skin, a green sleeveless dress, and a tall blue hat. She is surrounded by 12 priestesses that represent the 12 hours in a day. According to the experts, the woman in the drawing is depicting Tadi Ist traveling to the afterlife. Oscar Wilde once said, life imitates art far more than art imitates life. Okay, let's say hypothetically Marge has some ancient Egyptian doppelganger. Except The Simpsons has a history of predicting the future. The Simpsons predicted Donald Trump's presidency and assassination, the Titan sub implosion, Super Bowl winnings, and the list goes on and on. So, are the creators of The Simpsons time travelers? Are they tapping into ancient occult powers or what? It blows my mind that every single day that I get on TikTok, this is probably one of the most popular theories slash conspiracies out there is the Simpsons conspiracy. There's no way that out throughout the day, I cannot run across one of these clips. It always pops up. I'm not necessarily a big believer in The Simpsons being able to predict the future. I think truly that they've just made so many episodes that it just seems like it adds up. But in reality, it's not even 100% accurate. Some of these metaphors and episodes aren't one for one of what actually happened. It's just people putting those pieces together, making it seem like it predicted the future. But I cannot deny that painting inside of that coffin definitely looks like Marge Simpson. I dare you to try to explain the 100 ton granite boxes at the Seraphim of Saqqara in Egypt. There's 24 of these massive granite enclosures and you won't believe the official explanation for them. All 24 of them were moved into this underground complex dating to about 1400 BC where they now sit. And the craftsmanship of these boxes is once again insane. Perfect right angles and parallel sides leveled with machine-like precision, you know the drill. Made of granite, which reminder is harder than steel using bronze and stone tools that are softer than granite. Like, you know, using a plastic knife to cut through a car door. Try that out and let me know how it goes. But never mind that. I've already said it a hundred times about all all these other artifacts and ancient architecture throughout ancient Egypt because these boxes they're different. Let's start with the sheer size, about 100 tons each, and barely even fit through the hallways they would need to pass through to be placed in the pits that they currently sit in. As we can see from this unfinished box here that was abandoned in one of the passageways at the Serapium. If you couldn't tell, they're also made from a single piece of granite each, so it's not like they took smaller pieces and just glued them together. One big ass brick of granite, hollowed out from the inside into a perfect box, absolutely zero room for any mistakes. And I find it extremely difficult to imagine how once again, this sawing method could hollow out a granite box like this with flawless accuracy. Cause a hundred tons is a lot. The experts claim that we might be able to move hundred ton objects using primitive methods as long as we had enough people, which according to them is about 400. Tell me, how on earth would 400 people be able to coordinate moving 100 ton blocks in cramped hallways like these and around these super tight corners? For reference, this is what 400 people looks like all stuffed in there. Not to mention the boxes were perfectly placed in the center of rooms even smaller than the hallways. 
where do we have room for 400 people there? And I don't know if you noticed, but these hallways and pits are currently lit up with modern lighting, which the ancient Egyptians obviously didn't have. This Serapium would have been pitch black day and night 3,400 years ago, but of course they still had fire and torches that served this exact purpose, right? Except they found no evidence of soot, the leftover scorches from torch fire anywhere on the walls or ceilings in this complex as they would normally find in dark underground passageways. Any common sensical person would imagine that a project like this would have taken thousands of hours of work in torch lit chambers, yet not a shred of proof of that anywhere. So what did they use to see in the dark back then? And the entire Saqqara necropolis itself is dug into limestone bedrock. There's no granite found here, so they couldn't have chiseled these in place either, as some may suggest. What we do know is that these boxes were important, like super duper important. But for what? Clearly an undertaking of this scale would have surely held a higher purpose for their civilization. I mean, they definitely weren't tombs. They're obviously way too big, right? Nope, they still call them tombs. Made for, get this, the pharaoh's prized bulls. Yes, bull tombs. They said it, so it must be real. Now, upon discovery in 1850, most of these boxes were already open. Their lids either gone or moved over, so whatever was inside had likely already been stolen. You know, by those pesky thieves that conveniently steal everything that historians have no evidence of. But they found one box that was completely sealed, lid fully intact, so the bull skeleton must still be inside. A perfect opportunity to prove this theory. Well, firstly, they couldn't lift the lid, which is only about 30 tons, as they weren't able to get enough manpower in the room to even budge it. Yet the Egyptians somehow moved the entire 100-ton blocks themselves into those rooms thousands of years earlier. Makes sense. So they did the only logical thing that anyone from the 1800s would do in such a scenario. Blow it the f*** up with TNT. <laughs> yeah, for real. Archaeology was pretty savage back then. Which finally revealed the truth that the boxes at the Serapim of Saqqara were filled with... Nothing. Absolutely nothing. No mummy, no bull skeletons, no gold or treasure, nada. They did find mummified bull carcasses in a bunch of wooden sarcophagi, as would be expected, in an area called the Lesser Gallery, but not a single one found in any of the granite boxes. Cause yes, to be fair, the Apis Bull was a highly revered deity worshipped by the ancient Egyptians, symbolizing fertility and agriculture and the physical embodiment of their god Ptah. Hope I pronounced that right. I just find it hard to believe that a project of this colossal magnitude, which would have taken years, if not decades to complete was dedicated to sashing the bodies of dead animals. While at the same time, mummified bulls were found in much smaller, simpler wooden sarcophagi in the lesser gallery, which is oddly close to the public and no images of those exist either. Allegedly proving that this is how they stored bull remains. Not this. But then again, I'm just an idiot. Still others claim these boxes may have been power conductors that generated electricity for their civilization. Part of the infamous Giza power plant theory, which is a fringe idea that may or may not be true and I explained it in full in a previous video. So, are these really bull tombs or just a steaming load of bullshit? Man, I would love to travel back in time just to see how this was done, why it was done. This is a pretty big mystery. I also question if the lids were opened up and they presumed that thieves came and stole whatever was in the tombs, but modern day men back in the time could not even move the lid to see what was in a sealed one. How did they expect people to do that? How did they expect people to open up those lids and rob those tombs if that was the case? I would also like to know if there's anything under these black boxes. Like maybe they're sitting on a platform that is hiding something and we're not even aware of it. They need to remove them completely or maybe destroy one completely just to see if it's sitting on anything important. Because there could be a conduction pad or something under those black boxes that does help it produce power. And that is a really good point about the soot marks. I didn't think of that. You would think that if they were using torches, you would see the soot marks on the ceilings. Unless they cleaned up after themselves or they just didn't like the way it looked when you had a soot up ceiling. If any of you have any theories or guesses as to what those boxes are really made for, please leave a comment down below letting me know because I do find this one extremely fascinating. Okay, um, massive breaking news. There has just been a major global IT outage. And as we speak, planes around the world are being grounded. Some people cannot get into their bank accounts. Computers have been shutting down and are showing blue screens like this. Um, people say that they cannot pay for their groceries at the store. Emergency services have been disrupted. And um, this is happening all around the world. Now, we have very little information as to what's caused this outage specifically, but there were first reports in Australia, and then it spread to the US, and now it's global. This shit has gone international. Um, Japan, India, UK, Europe, Middle East, 
South Africa? I don't know. Uh, is there anything happening there? I'm going to be making a more detailed video about all of this immediately after this, but reports say that the outage uh, is related to an issue at the global cybersecurity firm CrowdStrike. They described it as a large-scale technical outage, but said that there was no information uh, immediately to suggest that it was a major cyber attack. I guess we'll see about that. Man, with outages like that going down, now I personally was not affected, but when I see things like that, it's time to start pulling the money out of the bank account because it's only a matter of time before they just say that you can't do that because there's no system to do that. Did any of you experience this outage? I was not even aware of it until I seen it on the news. Okay, you talk about the truth being stranger than fiction, and more than likely the truth is that it's artificial intelligence. But let's just go on down into the rabbit hole for a second, because I am told that this is an interdimensional being that they have used. This is at an aerospace company. They do experiments, and that they're creating other technology with this being, that they're using its mental capacity, its consciousness, its all this other stuff, that they're doing this with a lot of different beings, and this is how they're getting the technology. So, I mean, this is the story I get in the email when I receive this. And, uh, you know, like I say, anonymous person, uh, you know, more than likely, like I say, I'm not going to doubt somebody and t say they're lying about it, but why is it, you know, they, it's just like, I mean, this is weird. I mean, I can see them doing something like this, and I can see them, like, if they're recovering NHI, that this would be something they would do, but this is just, this like throws you for a loop when you see something like this. I mean, I'm personally 100% sure that that's an AI generated, <laughs> I'm almost 100% sure that that's an AI generated photo, but it does lead me to speculate, to theorize about the future because we are working with these micro brains or these microorganisms. Eventually, once they figure out how to make these brains smart enough, we will start seeing technology like that. I truly believe we're going to start seeing organic technology. Once they figure out how to make one of these little micro brains extremely smart, they know how to feed it just the right chemicals to make it highly intelligent, like Einstein level intelligent. They can mass produce that and have those brains work as a computer. It'll actually be able to think critically on certain situations I see that happening in the future. Now, that's probably far into the future, 20, 30 years from now, but I do see that happening. Hey, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and like the video and subscribe to the channel. I only ask once per video and I make a video like this almost every day. And currently we have 11,594 subscribers. So to everyone that's subscribed and or watching, thank you so much for being subscribed and thank you for watching. This is a house-sized orangutan Caught on camera. I don't even know how this exists. This is insane. If you zoom in, this thing is not AI. It's an actual orangutan. And it is huge. There's no way them things get that big. Look at it compared to that house. There's no freaking way. To me, that just looks like King Louis about to make himself a home. This religion shows you how to acquire supernatural powers by mountains and many religions are believed to be close to the divine, a source of spiritual inspiration, and even the dwelling places of gods. They often appear in religious texts and serve as essential pilgrimage sites. Some examples are Mount Sinai, Mount Olympus, Mount Kailash, Mount Fuji, and the list continues. For the followers of Shugendo, Mountains are places to find supernatural power. Once they acquire this power, they can save themselves and others through religious training while treading steep mountain ranges. I wonder if Aleister Crowley climbed mountains because he believed in this. Shugendo translates to the path of training and testing or the way to spiritual power through discipline. It combines various beliefs and practices from local folk traditions, Shinto mountain worship, and Buddhism. It began in Japan's Nara period during the 7th century. Practitioners known as Shugenja believe they can obtain the power to fly, walk on swords, become invisible, and enter boiling water. It was banned in 1872 by the government because it combined so many religious elements. The government at the time saw it as a threat, but the ban was eventually lifted at the end of World War II. Along with acquiring godlike powers, Shugenja looked to obtain Buddhahood within one's body through the practice of Soku Shinbutsu, or 
self-mummification. Allegedly in the 1980s, there was an arcade game that appeared in Portland, Oregon. Its gameplay is described as psychedelic and intense. The player would have to solve puzzles that would get more and more difficult as the levels progressed, resulting in the player becoming hypnotized and sometimes even dying. Polybius is an urban legend according to some, a game that never existed, or did it. Those who survived playing it say it was similar to the game Tempest, which came out in October of 1981. Perhaps it was the lack of designs and graphics on the outside shell of the machine that failed to make an impression on people, making it easily forgettable. But despite that, they say it drew in players like Moss to a flame. The only thing was, once you played the game, you were never the same again. Around the time of the release of Polybius, there were a series of players who died from playing some of these games. For example, Jeff Daly and Peter Bukowski both died from heart attacks allegedly caused by the game Berserker. Some reported seeing men in black sometimes appear to extract information from the Polybius machines, taking out what looked like a small device from it. Could Polybius have been part of a McUltra project? A way of testing the limits of the human mind? Maybe McUltra never ended and continued on in a different form. I've been gaming for as long as I can remember. I've never heard of a game called Polybius. And I've been a big fan of arcade cabinets for a long time. I actually wanted to put a couple of arcade cabinets behind me because I really am a big fan of arcade games. But it would not surprise me if the government was running tests on these arcade machines to see how our brains handled the stimulant. Whether this is a real arcade machine or a real game in general, I do believe that tests have been done in the past on arcade machines because it was a big thing people were all about and to be honest people are still all about arcades like where i live there's arcades all over the place you go to the beach there's like three or four of them just on one strip and they're always packed i mean who knows maybe arcade machines arcade games were created by a secret service to see if we were controllable to see if we could be easily brainwashed and with all the research that they've gained from it they were like huh yeah you know what these people are really easily controlled Let's give them all a cell phone and see if we can't progress it even further. We have a weird sighting. This is actually coming out of San Marcos, Texas, and it was captured on July 15th, 2024. This witness sees this oddity in the sky. I honestly have no idea what this could be. It looks like some sort of shadow, but in the middle of the sky. It's weird. Did anybody else in the area see this? Or do you have any idea what this could be? Take a look at this footage, drop a comment, and let us know. I mean, to me, that just looks like a Dementor in the sky. There's a lot of people in the comments saying that that could just be a swarm of bugs, maybe mosquitoes, and I could believe that. I really don't think it's some kind of interdimensional or alien-like creature. I think that it might be like what the people are saying in the comments. It's just a swarm of bugs. So let me know your thoughts on this one. Like, I ain't never experienced nothing like this. So as we driving back to base, I swear I seen a face in the rearview mirror. This creepy video is going viral right now, and it comes from TikTok user Japri. I'll tag him below. And after recently becoming an EMT, him and his partner are driving down the road when he sees a face in the rearview mirror. Feeling creeped out, they quickly pull over, and that's when he begins to record. That is, until he summons up the courage to go back to the ambulance and get the keys so they can get out of there. And this is what happens. Take a look. He drops his phone in a panic after a loud bang can be heard coming from the back. After a few moments, he grabs his phone, but what happens next is truly terrifying.
I don't know if you see it, but can can y'all see that back door? Like it just, oh shit, like it just flew open. Like can y'all? Oh. Nah, what the? F what was that? Can y'all see it? Oh, hell no, fuck that. <laughs> there, there's a comment on this video that really sums it up really well. Why all of a sudden, everyone that sees something spooky, the phone turns into a flip video phone? Like, that's so true. Dude, y'all seen this? You ain't gonna believe what she found in her drink. I just opened this Mike's Harder strawberry can. And I'm literally shaking because I'm so disgusted right now. I opened this and I took a sip. And then I was like, okay, maybe it's a little... I don't know. Something, maybe something's a little wrong with it. I don't know. So I took another sip just to make sure, and it was gross. <laughs> so I poured it out, and then it sounded like something was still inside. And so I... Trigger warning, trigger warning. Looked inside with my little light. And there's a fucking <coughs> dead mouse inside. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm fucking shaking. I feel so fucking sick right now. Bruh. Ah. That's fucking disgusting. Ah. I don't drink Mike's Hard Lemonade, but if I did and I had anything like that happen, there would be no way that I'd ever drink another one of those ever again. If this is a real video and there was an actual dead mouse in their drink, actions need to be taken against this company because that cannot be safe. Let's look at an artist that collaborates with Larva to create gold cocoons. These are how the cocoons turn out. Are you kidding me? Gold, turquoise, pearls. These are by Uber de Prat, and these little guys are caddisfish larva. So these little guys swim in rivers, and then when they become teenagers, they start growing a cocoon. They excrete silk from their salivary glands, and they use the materials around them, which is typically sticks, rocks, woods, leaves. So the artist learned about this. He also learned that there's sometimes gold in rivers. So he asked himself, are these caddisfly larvae making gold cocoons? So then he took the larvae, put them in his lab, and built these aquatic areas for them. But the materials that he used were not sticks and rocks and leaves. They were gold and turquoise and pearls. So naturally, they used the gold, and this is what they did. Look how cute that little guy is. Look at his little fingers. Look at him work. And the details of this, the way he organized the little pearls, he did that. He, he did that. And after they're done building the cocoon, they leave. And then they turn into a moth type of thing. There it is. The cocoon is left alone and then it's displayed. The artist sees himself as an architect and the little larva babies as his builders. But these are absolutely gorgeous. This one looks like it has like random little gemstones. And it's so interesting how these little larvae end up organizing all these little jewels and pearls. Because it's so good. I'm not going to lie. That was an extremely clever idea of the person to pull these larvas out and let them do this. Because that's really neat looking. They're not the prettiest looking. And the creatures are by far not cute. They're a very disturbing looking creature. But the art piece behind it is actually really cool. I actually really enjoy that. They say this is made in heaven, and it might just open a portal into another dimension. It actually might be a variation of something called an Euler's disc, named after mathematician Leonard Euler, which looks like Euler. And if it never stops, you might be dreaming. It's a disc that's intentionally designed to continuously fall for a very, very long time, and this is how it does that. As the disc spins and rolls, or spoles, it starts doing something called processing due to gravity, causing it to wobble with a fall that can last upwards to three minutes or even longer. Procession is just a change in orientation of a spinning object's rotational axis. Quite a mouthful, but all it means is that the imaginary line that cuts through a rotating object is constantly changing where it's pointing. Kind of like the Earth does, it rotates to create day-night cycles, and its axis of orientation slowly changes where it's pointing over time, finishing a complete cycle every 26,000 years, also known as a great year. This glass disc was purposely engineered to lose energy as slowly as possible as it comes to a complete stop. As the disc loses kinetic energy, the angle between the disc and the surface beneath gets smaller and smaller while the procession of the rolls approaches infinity. Don't worry, I don't fully understand it either, but this approach to infinity creates a rapid whirring motion that almost feels like it's about to open a portal into another dimension. 
Mathematically, this disc should technically spool forever and just keep getting faster until the end of time. But it comes to a complete stop due to friction, vibration, and air resistance. You know, physics getting in the way. The length of the fall can be extended even more if it's spun on a mirrored surface using the signature Euler's disc design of a chrome-plated steel puck held in a balance between gravity pushing it down and an upwards force exerted by the vibration of the mirror base. The low friction mirror slows down the energy loss even more and is slightly indented in the middle which helps it keep going too. And no one technically actually knows the exact details of how this particular Euler's disc design even works. Apart from its inventor, Joseph Bendick, as it's a trade secret and this disc is trademarked and sold by only one company. I think those Euler discs are so cool. I really want to buy one, but on Amazon, they're like 40 to $50 for that little tiny disc. I can't justify paying that much money for it, but they are really cool. Science is amazing. You know, call me a conspiracy theorist, but I guess it's just a coincidence that the name of Google's GPU is Adreno and their browser is named Chrome with a logo that looks like this. Boy, is this world filled with coincidences. But there's nothing to see here, guys. I mean, it is absolutely wild, the world that we live in. And for us who are conspiracy theorists, the things that we believe and the reality that makes, it's wild that we walk around in this world and the different realities that we all live in in our minds. I mean, straight up, for some people to believe things that they believe and then the things that we as conspiracy theorists believe, they're different realities. I mean, it is absolutely wild. And we really have no idea what truly is going on. The darkness behind the scenes. We have no clue. One day it will be revealed. But for now, we need to focus our eyes upon Jesus during these times. Okay, we need to be wise as a serpent, innocent and gentle as a dove, discerning truth and lies allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us. We do not want to be caught in these rabbit holes of conspiracy theories, but we want to be wise. We want to have understanding of what's happening, of the enemy. Because if you do not understand what your enemy is doing, then you are vulnerable. And we as Christians, as believers, need to be on guard. We need to have that wisdom, wisdom of Solomon for the will of God, to see what is going on, to be spiritual soldiers. And it is just wild. I mean... Some of these conspiracy theories, I get it, they sound absolutely insane to the mind of a secular person, someone who has grown up believing in everything the government tells you, everything that the public school, government-run school system tells you, right? Like, you hear, oh, no, but they're not doing that. No, nah, no, nah, they're not doing that. Like, I get it. I understand it sounds crazy. It's hard to grasp. But one day, when everything is revealed, we are all going to be shocked how truly, how truly evil some people are in the schemes of the enemy. But during this time, we focus on the Lord, allow his love, his light to go forth, to be salt and light in this world. And we need to fight evil with good. Love on others, give the truth, be gentle, kind, patient, long, uh, loving, long-suffering, transparent with integrity, guys. Don't get stuck in those rabbit holes. Again, it's fun, but you focus your eyes upon the Lord. Love you all so much. God bless and remember, the just shall live faith you know he says that people do there's a lot of people that do believe what the government tells them what the schools tell them and i get that because i truly also was one of those people that believed everything that the government said everything that the school systems were teaching and then after a while you start to become more aware of what's being said what's being shown and you start to alter your beliefs as to is what the government's saying true? Is what I learned in school true? To me, I understand that people follow those laws because they're an easy set of laws to follow. When the government says, hey, this is what's happening, people trust the government. I think they're trying to gain as much energy, as much money, as much power as they can from the people but with that being said it also makes me believe that the bible is within the same guidelines as the government i do believe that the governments have created these bibles to keep people under a certain control under a certain moral respect it's a really big topic i can talk about it for a long time but that's just truly something that i do think about in the back of my mind that maybe that is the case so let me know your thoughts that's not a rock but he was just really calm very curious and very confident. He wasn't afraid of me at all. And I believe that's the same guy 
that I'm having all these encounters with and doing all this stuff. I don't know, man. That Bigfoot looked very animatronic-like, also very well-groomed. So I have to give Bigfoot credit on that. He's making himself look good out there in the woods. And if he wasn't afraid of you and you're not afraid of it, I would approach it. I would have to approach it the, the closest that I could until it seemed threatening. So let me know, do you guys think that that was an actual Bigfoot or do you think that that was some kind of hoax? All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and end this video here. As always, if you found any of these clips interesting, links are in the description down below. And with that being said, have a good day.